Um, good evening, good afternoon, rather, in Greece, morning in the US. Um, I'm so happy to welcome you all to this last session of the webinars from Konkan to Coromandel that the Deccan Heritage Foundation has organized in collaboration with Cambridge University uh, and the um, and the Islamic um, the Islamic Center, as well as Bangalore International Center. I would also um, the co-hosts of this series were, uh, except for myself, I'm Helen Filon, um, and uh, it was Vivek uh, Gupta from the from Cambridge, and uh, we were also very happy to have amongst our uh, advisors, um, Marika Sardar. Uh, today is the last lecture of the fourth session of the seminars from Konkan to Koramandel. <coughs> and I think we have introduced in this session a lot of new subject matters, as well as new ideas. And I think Arthur's uh, lecture today will, will, is part of this uh, exciting new approach to the tile work of, uh, of the Deccan, of which we know very, very little. Um, the, there are many examples we have, all of which are different. We have underglazed painted techniques, we have a, a mosaic techniques, we have all sorts of techniques. Uh, some of them are exquisitely done, others less so, but they all uh, display and depict a series of possibilities and contexts that the Deccan had and of which we know really very little. So though we have a lot of examples, the, the tile work and the ceramics that we see on these amazing buildings that we have from both the Bahmani and the, the, the succeeding Sultanate period are very ambiguous. We don't know where they were made, by whom, as we have no kilns or any other material to show us who were the people that worked on these motifs and on these designs and on these techniques which uh, echo different traditions from the Mediterranean to Central Asia. I think that uh, Arthur is in an excellent, the, ex the person that can really um, uh, approach this subject to the wide knowledge that he has of ceramics, uh, of Islamic ceramics, uh, as Arthur was both a consultant in Islamic, Indian, Himalayan, and of Southeast Asian art in, uh, in London and uh, uh, he studied at Queen's College and SOAS, University of London. He started his career at Stotherby's and uh, later, and now he has, he advises collectors and auction rooms as well lecturing and writing on the ceramics and the tile work of Asia. And he has written two books, The Damascus Tiles, which is a, a, a wonderful compilation of really of his amazing knowledge on ceramics and their techniques. And most recently, he has really written the only book that we have on Indian tiles. Um, as there's a lot to talk about, I would like to ask uh, um, Arthur to uh, start his lecture as I think he has much more to say than I do. Thank you so much for being with us. And we hope um, to see you in, we hope to continue these, uh, these uh, webinars in uh, uh, next autumn when you will have had the time to consider all the new material that we have presented these last four sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you very much indeed, Helen, and, um, and thank you to uh, the Deccan Heritage Foundation. And I'm, I'm very honoured to be in the presence of so many real academics, unlike me, who's more of a sort of interested amateur. But um, I'm just going to share the screen now um, and we'll start. Right, I hope you can all see that, the first slide. Well, it's fair to say that there's been very little awareness of this area of art history in the subcontinent. And um, it's not just the Deccan, but tiles generally in India have been very much overlooked. What little attention there has been has been rather more centered on the Mughals. And um, I think really this is, this is a pity. I mean, I think it's, a pity that the tiles have been neglected generally, but the tiles of the Deccan, I think, are particularly interesting and particularly high quality and particularly varied. 
The problem, of course, is it's it, it, very little remains in situ and there's almost nothing in Western museums. So there's very little that's stimulated the interest. But what I want to try and do today is probably pose more questions than I answer. But um, I want to um, give an idea of the distinctive features which set these tiles apart from, um, from other Islamic tiles across the world and acknowledge all the external input that we see from Anatolia, Central Asia and Iran. Um, but also um, the things that make them particularly Indian and particularly Deccani. So we're just starting off now with the facade, the rather glorious facade of the tomb of Alauddin Bahman in Bidar. And um, you can see here um, both the, the, the pluses and the minuses of studying Deccani tiles. The, the great quality of the, the painting shines through, but also the um, the losses and the, um, the problems with um, deterioration over time, which are really quite extreme um, in the Deccan and in um, the Indian subcontinent generally. I, I wanted just to start, in fact, by showing some examples of um, other tiles from elsewhere on the subcontinent, just to give you an idea of the context. And um, on the top left, we've got um, a view of the, um, the tiled facade of the tomb of Bibi Jawindi um, in Uch in Pakistani Punjab. And um, this is, of course, um, probably the best known type of tile that you get um, from the subcontinent and, and things that probably people are more aware of than, than anything else. Underglaze painted blue and white tiles and very distinctive, um, very distinctive style on red earthenware. And on the right, we've got um, just a little fragment of cut tile mosaic um, from the, the um, mosque of Dianga in Lahore. And um, this is something which um, is particularly associated with the Punjab. But as we'll see in a minute, um, cut tile mosaic most certainly does feature in the, in the Deccan. Bottom left, we've got, um, um, we've got a tile probably from Tatar in Sindh underglaze painted blue and white and then in the middle a rather unusual tile um, from um, from Mandu um, from the younger sister's tomb early 16th century and then a very typical Mughal tile from the Shah Jahan period um, probably from the tomb of Madani in um, um, Kashmir in Srinagar um, with those very distinctive colours um, which we associate with Mughal Quedaseca tiles. Now, I just want to briefly talk about the techniques because um, there are certain techniques which um, feature both across India and Islamic world and also in the Deccan. Underglazed painting is a very, um, is, is quite simple to describe. It's um, basically painting on a white slip with a transparent glaze covering it. I mean, a lot of you probably are very familiar with these techniques, but just in case not. Um, Quer de Seca tiles, which you don't really see um, in the Deccan, but just so you know when I'm referring to it, um, the glaze is, uh, is applied directly, um, but so the colours are separated by a black line of a sort of manganese composition, which keeps the colours apart. Um, and actually with cashmere tiles, it's quite um, unusual to see, um, unlike the Persian ones, you get a slight shading of colour within, um, within the areas of, um, of pigments, so that um, you get a slightly more subtle sense of depth. And then on the right, we've got a very typical tile from Sultanate Bengal um, from the 15th century. And um, here it's rather like um, Quer de Seca, but the colours are, uh, they're not actually divided, but they do um, manage to keep apart. But the, the colours are painted directly onto the, onto the clay. So that's just by way of a little bit of background. So, Let's think a little bit about the origins of um, tiles in the Deccan. And um, this, of course, is right on the northwestern fringes of the Deccan, Dalatabad, the, um, the Chand Minar. Um, now, there's quite a lot of uncertainty about the dating of this building, and I'm not going to get terribly involved in the 
controversy about that, but it's very likely that um, that this building was, um, a, as uh, Mohit Manohar suggested um, last year, that it was built um, uh, all together as, as one thing, because earlier um, scholars were suggesting that the minaret came first and then the building. But the point is the tiles appear on both sections of the building. And I think these are probably an indication of the type of tiles um, which were first seen in the Deccan. Now, um, this, uh, this building's um, dated 40, um, mid 14th century, um, sorry, mid 15th century. And um, it's, it's um, probably a sort of carry on from, um, from earlier styles. There are some quite similar blue, plain blue tiles on the um, tomb of Muhammad II in um, Gulbarga, dated 1398. And I think those are probably the earliest tiles we, we know of in the Deccan. Um, but this type of very plain tile is much more linked to, um, to the sort of tiles we get in Sultanate Delhi. And um, it didn't really, um, uh, it, it didn't really continue. And quite extraordinarily, um, when Bidar finally became the capital in, of the Bahmani Sultanate in the 1430s, we get this um, very sophisticated appearance, um, which um, comes apparently from nowhere. And um, I think obviously we've, um, we've got to bear in mind the input of um, the, the cosmopolitan um, influence of um, people such as the, um, the, the uh, people at court, such as Mahmoud Gawan. And um, there was a, a very international crowd there. And um, some, of the, um, so, some of the inscriptions clearly make it obvious that, um, that uh, Persians and foreigners were involved there. Um, these designs are, um, th there's no real precedent and there's nothing really, um, there's, there's nothing really to, um, to see where they're coming from in, in a local context. Some of the best, some of the best tiles on this, um, on Alauddin's tomb are, um, and best preserved, are actually in the arch soffits here. And um, I'm just showing them alongside two other images to give you an idea of the sort of stylistic inspiration. Although, of course, um, you can tell that they're actually not at all the same and the, the, the Deccani tiles are very distinctive, but you can see the same sort of uh, leaf designs here um, on the, um, uh, the this um, to this um, building in um, Afghanistan, uh, sorry, in Iran. This is the, um, sorry, I'm getting so muddled with all these slide things, but um, uh, this is the, um, the Darbe Alam Isfahan. And on the right, the, um, the Friday mosque in, in Yaz, both from the mid 15th century. And you can see, um, you can see the sort of leaf and flower forms, um, which very much um, echo the designs on the Bahmani tiles. But in fact, the, um, the crucial difference is that the, um, the Bahmani tiles are underglaze painted and um, the, the, the Persian ones are cut tile mosaic. So it's quite surprising and strange that um, at this date we've got underglaze painted tiles, which um, which you do seem to spring out of out of nowhere. And although they're they're following the designs of the Timurids, they're um, they're not um, um, they're not following the technique. I mean, as I said, we do see cut tile mosaic at a later date. And I'm just showing at the top there um, a um, picture a detail of a yuan vase in the VNA, which um, um, which uh, shows this same sort of lotus leaf design which you've got there and there. Um, but um, that gives you an idea of the um, of, of the very sort of mixed heritage of, of these tiles. Ah oh, good it actually changed the slide. Um, this is some um, this, this is just a, a sort of closer up image of one of these tiles, a fragment that's obviously dropped or, or been pulled off the, um, uh, the Alauddin 
tomb um, and, and thanks to Helen Philon for um, sending me this image. But um, what I want to show particularly is the fabric underneath. You can see it's this sort of whitish material which um, is um, a composition known as fritware which is very commonly seen across the rest of the Islamic world. And um, this is the material um, used in um, um, it, it, in almost all of the tiles in the Deccan. Although I say that, but um, quite a lot of um, analysis and research still needs to be done on, on the materials. And um, a lot of this I'm just assuming from, from personal observation and examination of these tiles. Um, but I mean, as, as for, for people who aren't aware of the um, of, of the de definition of fritware, it's a composition of only about 10% clay, and the rest of it um, is a silica sand-like mix um, from ground down quartz. And this is a technology not seen in, um, in the Indian subcontinent before this period, and um, but simultaneously in um, in the Deccan and in the Sultanate in the north, um, it's it started um, increasingly being used for for tiles, but not exclusively. But the other type of fabric, as we've already mentioned, is um, in the Indus Valley and also in Bengal, which is um, just the simple red earthenware. And we've got a slightly confusing picture, which we'll come to in a minute, um, about the uh, mixture of different materials in the Deccan. And here's another um, group of tiles in the fort, um, in the um, Diwaniyam, which uh, sadly no longer exists. These images are taken from Yazdani's important work on Bidar, um, published in 1947. And um, you can see here um, on the left, you can see some images of tile panels still in situ. And although the panels are still there, the, the, the frames are still there, the, um, the actual tiles have sadly long since gone. Um, there are two things to say here about the, um, about the uh, colours, which are quite interesting. First of all, on the right, you can see um, there are little flashes of red pigment, which is a very um, rare and, and very difficult colour to achieve um, in, in, um, in, in fired ceramics. And of course, the best known um, use of red is in, uh, in the sort of classical Ottoman Iznik pottery and tiles, um, but it hardly appears elsewhere. You do see it on um, Minai pottery um, in, in um, Selchuk times, but that's slightly different, painted on top of the surface and um, fired subsequently, whereas um, the, the, the um, glazing in underglaze, um, when you've got the red, is, is, is the very difficult thing to achieve. Now, I have wondered whether perhaps the, um, uh, the, the, the these plates being hand painted were um, perhaps mistaken and um, or, or exaggerated the colour. Maybe it was just a brown. But in fact, yes, Dani does mention in his text that the um, um, that the, uh, the the colour red does appear. And in fact, there are a few fragments. I've seen some little pieces which um, Helen Philon's shown me from the store in the museum, um, admittedly not underglaze painted, but um, little patches of red um, um, cut tile mosaic, um, just fragments in, in the museum. But probably the best known um, architectural structure in, in uh, Bidar is the, um, um, is the Madrasa of Mahmud Gawan, um, built in the 1470s. And um, it's it's today only just a fragment, and um, you can see on the plan there, taken from Yazdani, um, that we're just looking at the right-hand half of the facade. But um, there are some very spectacular tiles high up, probably where they couldn't so easily be reached by um, people wanting to pick them off the walls. But um, uh, quite apart from the the quality of the of of the mosaic work and the inventiveness of the design. I mean, particularly the band 
um, here, which separates the, um, the, the main panels and window openings, um, is, is unlike anything seen um, in tile work elsewhere, both in terms of colour and design. Um, but I've shown you on the right um, a detail because um, it's rather interesting. I was talking um, ab about the yellow and these yellow borders, which you do see um, throughout this, um, throughout the 15th century. Um, but you don't really get at this period yellow incorporated in, in the glaze, just like the, the red. Um, it's obviously provided um, it, it obviously caused technical problems because um, we only really see um, yellow and even then running slightly in the Baridi period in the, um, in the 16th century. But what they have done here, um, they've inserted these lower tiles, which is this spandrel on, on the, um, uh, over the arch. Um, they've, um, the, 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 the tiles are actually under glaze painted, but um, what they've done is cut out little spaces and inserted um, plain yellow pieces. So it's a sort of hybrid technique of, um, uh, of under glaze painted and mosaic tiles. Um, and um, this is something, this is something very unusual, which, um, you know, which is, it's, unprecedented elsewhere in the Islamic world. And it's probably a practical solution to, um, to a technical difficulty, but rather, um, um, rather inventive that they persisted and insisted on, um, on including yellow in the design. Um, this is the, uh, a detail of the minaret. And as you can see, it's got a very similar sort of band of inscription. Um, high up. I just really want to um, point out here that um, there's, um, I think there's probably more uh, to be revealed here. I, I don't know when this um, plaster was covered, but you can see um, when you look at it that the, it's not, this is not just loss of tile and weathering. Um, you can see there the, um, the color of the body of the tiles where it has weathered. But these bits look very much covered over. And I have a feeling that um, if anyone had the time or the funding to, um, to try and uh, expose more of the colour, I'm, I'm sure there would be more hidden away because it very much does look like a coating on top. But I'm just really basing this on what I can see from a distance. This sort of mixture of different tile types and media is something you see um, uh, across Bidar. And um, this is the um, Shaza Dawaza um, built in 1503, I think. And um, it's got quite a, an interesting mixture of different tiles. Um, there's this wonderful um, carved basalt inscription um, over the main entrance. And then above it, you've got, um, you, you've got some very nice brightly coloured cut tile mosaic. And then you have the basalt inscription continues um, on either balcony in um, underglaze painted blue and white inscription. Um, but then over on, on this side, there's a, a projecting lodger, which um, I hadn't actually, I have to admit, um, really had a good look at when I was there, but it's got some, um, also interesting and unusual tiles. We've got um, um, hexagonal tiles, and I, I was wondering whether possibly these have been repositioned because they look, they do look slightly sort of jammed into the stonework there. But um, uh, it's it's difficult to say. I mean, I think um, I, I think there's probably no reason to think that they they were added later. Um, but um, but there, these tiles are not quite like anything else that um, appears in Bidar. There are some vaguely similar ones in the, um, in the store in the museum. Um, down below, we've got um, some cut tile um, designs, which are slightly similar to the um, facade of Mahmoud Gawan, and then some, um, some other polychrome tiles. Well, I think they're polychrome. Um, there's a sort of pinkish color there, but it may of course just be the where the glaze has dropped away. 
Um, as, as I say, I didn't get a chance to um, look at these ones very closely. But um, I think these would definitely repay further study and research. The other interesting group of tiles is in the um, uh, inside the fort in the Taj Mahal. And um, these are um, not underglaze painted, they're cut tile, but rather an interesting mixture of, um, of, of plain hexagonal tiles and then shaped what appear to be bricks. And we've got this um, the, this um, lion and sun emblem, and you can see on the right, um, uh, Yazdani has sort of recreated, as, as he saw, in fact, the other side of the archway. Um, and down below, uh, this, this symbol of the, the, um, of the lion and sun is um, something which in, in more recent times has been very much associated with um, sort of Persian national identity, but in fact it does go back um, quite a long way to, um, uh, to, to um, astrological uh, treatises, which an example of which in the Bibliothèque Nationale is down at the bottom. But looking at these tiles, I think one thing, it looks as though we've got two different fabrics here. We've got um, what appears to be um, fritware hexagonal tiles, but mixed in with earthenware, um, probably these look like um, earthenware bricks, which have been cut to shape, um, because they definitely seem to have weathered differently and come out in different colours. But of course, it is possible that they're different batches. But again, it would be very interesting to see exactly what these tiles are made of. And you can just see on the right there um, some rather interesting um, cut brick and tile shapes. Um, of course, I say that a lot of the tiles have been lost and in fact we're really often just talking about the glaze that's been lost and um, um, very often we can uh, learn quite a lot just from the um, from the imprints of tiles. Certainly they tell us, um, you know, they're better than nothing, they do tell us um, quite a bit. And probably the best preserved um, building in the um, uh, in the fort at Bidar is the um, Rangini Mahal, um, which um, was built around, it was built in phases added to, um, but uh, it, the, most of this probably um, dates from the early Baridi mm. period, uh, the sort of beginning of the uh, beginning of the 16th century. Mm. But you see here um, this wonderful mixture of the um, the carved wood in a very South Indian Dravidian style, and then this very sophisticated, beautifully made um, cut tile mosaic, and then the um, more of this carved basalt framing, which um, which is very often used to frame panels of tiles, as we've as we've seen already. This is the inside of uh, the the sort of inner chamber in the. Um, in the Rangini Mahal, um, and we've got some um, some wonderful um, cut tile mosaic dados, and you can see on the right um, a comparison um, with the um, the tiles in uh, um, in uh, just outside Herat in uh, Gazogar. Um, Sim similar, well, probably about um, forty or fifty years earlier, but um, um, you can see some similar um, motifs and designs. And it's also just worth mentioning in passing the um, mother of pearl inlay in the, um, in the basalt arch, which um, um, is thought to have inspired the well-known Bidru work, which um, is the silver inlaid black metal. But, um, but um, it's, uh, it's very likely it arose out of inspiration from, um, from this mother of pearl inlay work. And yes, I was saying that um, imprints can tell us a lot. This is um, one of the side chambers on, on the, the um, eastern end of the Rangini Mahal. And you can see, um, again, hexagonal tiles in a dado um, with borders above and below, and then this ogival medallion, um, very, very much um, Turkish inspired. And um, it's... Um, it, it, it's, it's an example of, um, of uh, this sort of very cosmopolitan input. I'll just show you here in, um, in, uh, in Bursa, you can see very much the same arrangement with 
hexagonal tiles. Uh, hexagonal tiles do seem to be, I don't know why, but hexagonal tiles in, across the Islamic world are very much favoured for treatment of dados. And, um, and, and in the Mamluk period, um, except the sort of heyday of, uh, of um, blue and white uh, underglaze painted hexagonal tiles, um, very um, famous place, of course, in Damascus, the um, um, Ghaz al-Din Tarizi mosque with, um, um, with, with hexagonal tiles in the, in the dado. Um, this is um, this is the the green to tomb in Bursa, um, dated 1421, and um, you can see the very clear parallels with the uh, with the medallion in the middle of the hexagonal tiles. Um, now this is um, unfortunately another another lot of tiles which I didn't uh, manage to see at the time. The gate was firmly locked of the Tarkash Mahal when I was there. Um, this is again a, a rather confusing building which has had alterations throughout the 16th century and possibly even later. But these rather interesting tiles I think um, show a further development. Um, we can see the yellow separately fired yellow borders on either side but more importantly we've got yellow now appearing in the middle of the um the the underglaze painted area i say underglaze painted um i i think i think these are underglaze but of course i haven't really examined them closely i think it would be very unlikely they're quer de seca um, because we don't really see quota secca tiles in this in this area, but it, it isn't impossible. But um, I've shown you up above um, just to give an idea of the sort of inspiration from um, from the um, again from the green tomb in Bursa. Um, these rather distinctive long petaled flowers, which um, which you you can see down here in this um, in this band of tiles. There's very little of this. Uh, very little of this left, but um, they're, they're sort of pretty much without parallel, apart from uh, a few more fragments in the museum store. The other important tile, we're spending quite a lot of time on Bidar because um, I think these are really probably um, the most interesting tiles and the earliest ones in the Deccan, but we will be looking at other things later. But just to finish off with Bidar, um, the tomb of Ali um, Barid, which uh, dates from the 1570s, um, we can see um, this tradition continuing. Um, the late scholar Mark Zabrowski was slightly dismissive of these tiles, saying that they um, um, sort of perhaps rather poorly imitating um, Isnik prototypes. But I don't really, I don't really think that's quite fair because um, the the quality of um, the quality of the underglaze painting is really pretty good. Um, we've got to, of course, make allowances for all the bird and bat droppings, which are rather obscuring the picture. And in fact, even more so, if we peer up into the do into the dome, um, we can see really a quite stunning array of tiles. But it's terribly difficult to look at because of the distance and the darkness, and um, and and also the fact that they're incredibly dirty. So, um, but you can see here this lower band, an absolute um, feast of um, floral forms. Um, very densely packed and quite naturalistic, a bit more naturalistic perhaps than the tiles we've seen um, on, on some of the earlier buildings, such as Alauddin's tomb. Um, but um, we can see that, uh, that, that the artists were becoming a bit more adventurous. Um, but it'd be very nice if, um, if, if someone at some stage could um, really look at these carefully and uh, photograph them and clean them and examine them because uh, they, they really are quite stunning. And in fact, it's one of those things where, um, you know, after the, I took photographs at the time and then with a bit of uh, manipulation and brightening the pictures, you discover a lot more um, long after you've left the site. So now we move on to Bidar and um, to Bijapur and um, the, the the great mosque 
um, there, which was built around the same time as the, um, the Baridi tomb we were just looking at in the 1570s. Um, best known actually for the 17th century um, mirab at the back, you can see on the, on the left, but there are a few tiles um, which um, you can see arranged around this arch and there are one or two other groups in the building. Um, and I've got here a few close-ups of um, to show you what we're talking about. They're again cut tile, um, probably fritware, um, cut tile mosaic. A little bit more basic and a bit more crude perhaps than, um, than we've seen in, in um, Bidar, um, but still quite attractive. Rather perhaps again a little bit more limited in range of colour as well. Um, there's really very little else to um, point out still in situ in Bijapur, but we do have some rather interesting fragments in the British Museum which, um, um, which raise a few questions. Um, we've got, um, this is a sample of three of them and on the left, we've got, um, uh, and I've shown the reverses below, we've got um, a, a fragment which must be quite closely allied to the tiles we were just looking at in the mosque, the same sort of plain yellow, probably part of a mosaic panel. Um, and uh, you can see the, the back of the tile, it's very much that whitish grey fritware material. But um, in the middle, we've got um, a rather different sort of tile, blue and white underglaze painted. And this is a red clay tile. Um, you can see the bottom. These are all, um, they've all got Bijapur written on them. They, they um, came to the um, British Museum in the 19th century, but um, nothing's known about where they came from. Um, and then on the right, we've got a blue and white underglaze painted fritware tile. And this is, part of a group of um, about a dozen, I, I think about a dozen tiles. And, um, and, and it'd be really very interesting to know um, a little bit more about um, where they came from and how they were used. They're also hexagonal tiles, um, again, blue and white. And there's a bit of a clue here because um, the, um, these, the one on the left is, is red clay um, with a sort of international, what one might call international timurid design. And the one on the right, very similar design, just a fragment, but made of fritware. But um, the tile on the left is actually um, very, very similar to uh, tiles you see in Sindh. And I think, I think we can be fairly certain that um, the red earthenware tiles were, um, were made in, in, um, in uh, Tata or thereabouts in, in the um, Indus region in Sindh. Um, so the question is, how did they get there? And why do we see these two different materials? Well, to suggest an answer for the second question, I think probably most likely is however the tiles got to Bijapur, um, the, um, there weren't enough and probably the um, local craftsmen um, made replicas um, with, uh, on the fritware body, which they were more familiar with and to supplement the quantity. Um, but um, I think that probably seems the most likely uh, explanation. As to how they got there, well, um, let's just let's just have a look at some other ones. Um, the the tile on the left in the small images in the British Museum, and you can see identical tiles um, still in situ in um, on Mackley Hill in in Sindh. Um, an anonymous um, tomb, ruined and extremely vulnerable looking um, tiles sitting there. And, um, you know, I have to say as, as someone in the commercial art world myself, it um, makes me feel very uncomfortable when I see tiles like this appearing in auction. And I think it's pretty clear where they've been coming from because, um, because you can see that they're, um, um, they're disappearing um, bit by bit and they're not really terribly well protected. So I was starting to ask a question about how they got to Bijapur. Um, the, 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 I think part of the clue may be Goa and the Portuguese. Um, there are some 
also some tiles which very clearly um, were made in Sindh in Goa. Um, and um, they none of them actually appear on buildings that can be of the same date as the likely date of the tiles. Um, we've got on the left um, a, a photograph of the plinth of the statue of St Francis Xavier in um, um, in the Casa Professor, which is one of the um, buildings adjoining the um, Basilica of Bom Jesus. Um, and this statue was made in um, in the early 20th century. So the plinth um, and the tiles were put on the plinth, obviously, in relatively recent times. On the right, we've got um, the well-known convent of Santa Monica, where we've got these tiles, a mixture of different designs, some um, identical to examples um, found in Tata, or at least found in um, Tata and Mackley by Cousins when he was um, writing his, um, putting together his book, Portfolio of Sin Tiles, um, at the beginning of the 20th century. But there are some other rather unusual designs, which I don't want to particularly go into that now because we're going to get a bit short of time, but um, there have been um, suggestions that these strange tree designs were um, commissions produced for the Portuguese because they're sort of Western looking, but I, I don't really see that. And um, I think um, I, I think I'd go into it a little bit more in, in my book, but um, there are some um, th th there are some sort of similar designs and similar motifs, not quite the same, but um, I, th I think just the fact that we haven't um, we haven't uh, seen other tiles like this in Sindh today. Uh, doesn't mean that they weren't originally made um, made for um, made for lo local consumption um, in Sindh. Now, but what about the Portuguese? Well, I think um, one possible explanation is that the Portuguese sacked Tata in. Um, I think the date was 1556. And um, it's, it, it is said that they um, plundered all sorts of things and quite possibly including tiles. And um, until a few years ago, there were a lot of um, blue and white tiles in this Jesuit church in Bassein, just north of Mumbai. Um, and there's nothing there today. I was very disappointed to find, but um, still a rather nice place to visit. But um, no, no, um, no tiles, sadly. But um, but um, cousins does mention um, blue and white tiles plundered from Sindh in this church. So um, I think it's pro probably most likely that the tiles used in Goa in in, in a sort of Christian context um, were part of this plunder, and some of them ended up in this Portuguese enclave, and the rest. Um, travelled on to Goa and then maybe um, rather than being commercially imported to Bijapur they just somehow found their way from from Goa to Bijapur and, and were used there. The, the number of tiles of course as, as, as we've already said is very small so it doesn't look like the hexagonal blue and white tiles were um, part of a major um, decorative style seen in Bijapur but we may be wrong so much has been lost. So now we come on to the um, the other main um, centre of power in in the Deccan, um, Golconda and and um, Hyderabad, and um, Golconda, of course, gave way to Hyderabad as the prosperity and peace um, increased in the Adil Shahi kingdom. Um, but of course, Golconda carried on, it was carried on to be used as a fortress, but also from our point of view, most interestingly, um, for um, the royal tombs. And um, work's going on on the tombs at the moment. The Aga Khan Foundation is doing a lot of very good work um, uh, re restoring the buildings. Um, but today you do get a rather false impression. You can see on the right, um, this is the tomb of um, Ibrahim, um, which um, just has that little patch of tiles, which you can see in the other image, um, a detail, rather beautiful tiles, but the rest of it is all just white plaster. And that's really the case with an awful lot of these tombs. Um, and um, 
clearly there was that they were all tiled because little fragments have been found and um indeed we'll be looking at a minute in a minute um i think yes here we are um this is um the tomb of uh, on the left um newly discovered fragments covered in plaster on the tomb of um um Kuli shah um and then we can see on the right um, the tomb of Muhammad, which has got little, just tiny little fragments, really just enhancing the architecture, um, monochrome pieces, which um, probably are just the tip of the iceberg. And I'm very, very sure that um, that, that uh, it was ablaze with colour originally. Um, so I think there is more to discover. And this brings us on to the matter of conservation, really, because um, it's obviously um, in the past, the idea was just to keep the building standing and slap plaster on just to protect it. But um, it's a great shame that um, clearly a lot of these um, bits of decoration have been, um, um, have been covered over. This is, um, this is rather interesting that a, a much later tomb, just a tiny little fragment, but it shows the Mughal influence. The colours are quite different, these sort of bright oranges and greens. And um, it's um, cut tile mosaic, but very much redolent of the Quedaseca tiles of the Mughal era. Um, I'm very much aware I'm slightly running out of time, but I must just show you the um, the, the, the most glorious and best preserved tiles in Hyderabad, a terribly underappreciated site. I was amazed that um, uh, it was very difficult to find anyone in Hyderabad who knew where this building, the Ashur Khana, um, was situated. And um, it, uh, we were driving around for ages until it was found. It's um, terribly underappreciated um, site and, and probably amongst the finest cut tile mosaics in in, in in beautifully put together. Um, I'm going to just speed on very quickly just to just to point out I won't I won't um, take up any more of the time but um, just to point out two other things the um, uh, fragments found in in um, Hampi which I think would um, definitely benefit from further research um, um, uh, uh, fritware fragments. Um, I mean, we know that tiles do appear in Hindu uh, contexts in India, in obviously Gwalior and Bundelkhand, um, but not anything is really known about tiles in Hampi. Um, and it's quite possible there are a few Muslim tombs which haven't been fully investigated. And these tiles, which bear quite a resemblance to the Barmani tiles, um, may have come from the tomb, but uh, from one of those tombs. But um, we just don't know enough. These are in the V&A and were found allegedly in, a, um, in the environs of a palace, but not specified where in, in 1914. But uh, John Fritz and George Michel, who of course are um, the real experts on Hampi, have found one or two other fragments in the course of their research, but not a great deal. Ah, well, um, I was going to show another slide, but I think we better leave it there for now because I can't even get to it and it was just an aside. So I think we'll, um, we'll leave it there and, um, and then we can have a few discussions and questions. So Thank you so much, um, uh, Arthur. I'm so sorry about some of the technical difficulties that we were having, but I think we managed to see some really, really beautiful tiles and get some really excellent discussion from you about these tiles. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, um, open up the discussion to our audience. Um, Everybody can sort of uh, chime in with questions um, as they wish um, on the in the chat box. Um, I was personally wondering um, while you were speaking, just to ask a first question um, about what we know about the specific um, tile makers, the Kashi cars. These, you know, were they? Uh, I, some of the ideas that you were sharing resonated with me as far as you know. I. I 
I work on manuscripts. So I was thinking about manuscript makers. Who are these people? Where are they coming from? How are they sort of, you know, um, what, who's responsible for this work? And um, so um, I, that's one question that I have. Um, and, and really whether or not we can tell anything about where particular tiles were made based on materials. So, um, so for example, uh, you had mentioned the styles um, of particular tiles that were made in, in Tapta or Multan, but really, um, what is there anything besides style that we can rely on in order to figure out where exactly a tile may have been made? Um, that's all the questions that I will ask you and then we'll get to our, um, our audience. Thank you so much. Well, that's a pleasure. We, we, we know really very little about, um, for certain about where they were made. Um, and I think this is going to be um, a very important avenue of research because, um, you know, we can learn a lot from, um, uh, fr from technical analysis and it's becoming more and more sophisticated. Um, there's been quite a lot of work done on the fabric of tiles um, in the north of India and in Pakistan. Um, Maninda Singh Gill, who I think is um, with us today, um, has done a lot of work and um, one or two other people as well on, um, on the analysis of the material. But uh, as Helen was saying earlier on, um, there's really no sign of kilns or anything. So it's all quite quite mysterious. I mean, the problem is that there's so many layers of history and things have got obliterated that um, that we just, um, um, that, you know, we, we, we've got very little to go on. So obviously the style of the tiles is, is you know, is the biggest clue we have. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the first bit of the question, which was rather interesting. Um, your first half, can you just remind me? <laughs> Related to that question, and actually, I see right now that Susan Bean, um, uh, hello, Susan, uh, has asked a similar question about the makers of these tiles, the identity of the people who um, who were making them. Um, whether yeah. you know, for example, in we um, in the tomb of Ahmed Shah, we have a signature of a particular. Um, um, I think it's sir is the the Nisbas Kazvini, but. Does that really tell us anything about his affiliation, where he comes from? Um, and so I, I'm, I'm wondering from your research, whether there's anything that tells us about the makers, could not the, you know, the tile makers in Gore or Bengal be from that region? Whereas some of these underglazed tiles that we're seeing they may be made by Iranians and shipped abroad or, um, so I, I mean, I, I'm really interested in, in this because tiles, especially for 15th century scholarship are, is such an exciting and quite an important avenue of research, especially in thinking of Gulru Nejipalu's really important article on, um, on the Timuran International and tiles. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really wondering whether or not the Deccan can be inscribed directly within this sort of network of places where tiles may have been exported. So that's really a number of questions for you to think about. <laughs> yes, well, I, I mean, the answers are few and far between, but I think, um, I mean, I think very, I mean, the Persian craftsmen are, are definitely involved. Right. I think we can assume that, but whether, I don't, actually think um, necessarily that the um, the tiles were imported. I think it's probably much more likely that the craftsmen came there um, because it would have been very um, very difficult and expensive to um, import tiles. And also the, I'm um, just from my um, very non-technical observation of the tiles there, that the fabric is is a bit different from um, from tiles in Iran, just subtly different, and it does look like the material is that that they've been made um, perhaps a little bit more crumbly than the material that you get in um, in India and in the Deccan. Um, just the other point is that um, 
you know, lots of different types of specialists were involved in um, tile in, in um, producing these tiles. We have the the designer of the building, and then we have the calligraphers who played, of course, a very important role in the inscriptional tiles. And then we've got the um, the actual technical people, and they were all. It was very much a collaboration, and um, I think um, I, I think it's um, um, it, 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 it's it's very difficult to sort of pick out um, where these people came from. But I, I think for certain foreigners were involved, um, probably Iranians, and for certain locals were involved. Um, one rather interesting thing on the um, facade of the um, Madrasa of Mahmud Gawan is you do notice that the underglaze painted tiles, they're not a standard size, they're every single tile is different. And I think this means that to make those tiles in another country and bring them to um, it to India would have been just too complicated for words. And I think they must have been made very locally because it would have just been, well, it would have been a, a nightmare to untangle the, uh, um, you know, the positioning of each tile because they're, they're not one of them matches. And when you look at the imprints on the wall, um, it's, it's fascinating. And it, I couldn't really quite see why, I mean, you'd have thought the natural inclination would be to make tiles of identical size, but um, that's not what we've done. Um, Helen, do you have a question? Yes, yes. Can, I, can I ask you about the red color that uh, is so dominant, especially on the tiles that decorated uh, the, ta the, the Divanyam, um, yes. and were published by? We have, of course, Minai, which is very different, but we have, of course, as you mentioned, the Ottoman. But the Mamluks, um, when I was working on the tiles at the Benaki, on the tiles on the ceramics of the Benaki, there were a number of Mamluk examples that precede or were exported to, to, uh, to Cairo, where th that seemed to have preceded the use of red that we know from the 16th century in uh, in, uh, um, in, the, in Iznik. Um, and as the more I look at, at the, the work and the, and the designs that they have, I think that we have to start considering the possibility that the Mamluks were also involved since they were trading partners, I think in many ways with the Deccanis because uh, Mahmoud Gawan and others really had representations in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Cairo, um, encouraging obviously these uh, commercial relations. And though I don't think it's Minai and I don't think it's Isnik, I think the fact that you have these, uh, these small examples of red color, which is so difficult to produce in, uh, in, in, on, on Mamluk uh, ceramics, not tile ceramics. Um, I was wondering whether in fact there's this possibility that in fact some of these came with craftsmen from the Mamluk kingdom. Yes. Uh, I think that's, I think it is quite possible. I mean, I should say, I mean, the Mamluk tiles I've seen with the, with the red, it's sort of more of a sort of russety, browny yes. colour than Absolutely. the full red. Um, but it, I, I mean, that may also be the case for these lost tiles in the, um, in the Duwani Am as well. I mean, uh, Yazdani makes them look brilliant red, but mm -hmm. uh, they may well not, not have been yes. as red as that. But can I ask, but don't you think it also depends on the quality of the iron? Yes, yes. And, and as India had uh, so much, I mean, there were so many places where iron was produced. Mm. Perhaps the quality of their iron was much better than the other. And perhaps it's Indian iron that is responsible for the brighter red that yes. we have later. I well, mean, the, it's, there's a hypothesis, but I mean, yes. there are all these things that have to find solutions and answers. Uh, yes. And of course, we don't know the answer to that, but I mean, simply we have to think about it as being something which, uh, um, you know, I think the Deccan was very much part, I think, yes. of the Timurid world and very much part of the 15th century international Timurid world and, and, and the 16th as well. So, you know, I think we can't mm -hmm. isolate the Deccan from what was happening elsewhere. No, no. and I, I mean, I should say that there are some um, red pigments um, appeared in um, in Bengal as well. Um, mm. There's a fragment from the now lost tomb of um, Hussein Shah, I think, um, mm. 
which um, there's a picture in um, in the publication, I can't remember the name, which shows a very brilliant red. I mean, really comparable with Isnik red in mm. Gaul. And then also there are some late mobile tiles in um, Patna, in that um, some floor tiles in, in an 18th century um, small mosque, which um, have also got a sort of uh, quite sort of reddish brown colour as well. So um, it, it is around, but it, it does seem to have been something people struggled with because um, it's not that common. But I, also I noticed that um, particularly in, in Mughal buildings um, that um, red pigment is often just painted on plaster in the sort of adjacent to the tiles as though this was an easier way of achieving the colour. No, the effect, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I can see Marika is asked. Marika, would you like to ask your question by voice? She's asking about um, how the yellow color was achieved. Well, it's a, it's a mix. I don't know exactly. Again, I mean, it'd be very interesting to um, uh, to actually analyze these glazes. And you know, as far as I know, um, it it hasn't been. But it's a mixture of tin, lead, and zinc um, metallic oxides that produce the yellow. Um, and I know that the um, that analysis has been done in North India, and um, I forget the exact proportions, but. Um, but yellow, um, uh, yellow was um, um, produced with a mixture of those uh, of those oxides. We have some. We have another question about um, what makes Deccani tiles distinctive. But I wanted to ask you um, about regionality and tile. So you know, the case of Katta and Sindh is very interesting because clearly these tiles meant something that they were circulating and being used in other buildings and sort of used as sort of a, a commodity of sorts, right? Um, but, and so I'm wondering, uh, was there, do you get a sense of any other sort of regional specificities about Deccani tiles or, um, or other regions within India? So, for example, Mandu uh, or, or Malwa also has um, its own, I don't know whether we can call it a tradition, but it, ha it certainly has evidence of practice of tile making. Um, uh, so um, just a comment about the specificity of regions. Yes, well, it's quite, I think, um, I mean, the thing about the Deccan is, it is, as we've seen already, quite varied, and it is quite difficult to pin it down. I mean, I think, um, I mean, in Mandu, for example, um, you know, there's a lot of similarities with tiles in Bidar, but I mean, I noticed, for example, in um, uh, the cut tile, cut tile mosaic fragments in um, uh, on one of the tombs, I forget which in Mandu, you've got this very distinctive aubergine purple, um, which I don't think you see so much in the Deccan, and there are a few things like that which um, which uh, do vary, and of course. Um, the, the two regions which really are um, um, completely on, on their own in terms of distinctiveness are um, the Indus region and Bengal, because um, they're very, you know, there's absolutely no mistaking their, um, their, um, their own style and, and technique. But it's a bit more, it's a bit more difficult to sort of pin down. I mean, the, the Mughals uh, produced um, actually more limited quer de seca tiles than one would think, given what we see in museums in the West, which are quite a lot. But um, but when you're actually there, there aren't that many examples. But quer de seca tiles um, certainly don't appear everywhere. And I think we could we could probably say that those are particularly associated with Mughal North yeah. India, specifically Shah Jahan's period. So, um, Helen? <laughs> and, and I know that um, in, in his book, Mark Zabrowski mentioned uh, the Queda Seca technique, um, and Georgia as well repeated it in the book that they, they jointly authored. But I haven't seen a single Queda Seca technique tie before the Baridi period uh, and the 16th century in Bidar. You've seen imitation. Queer de Second, where purple is occasionally used, 
but not there's no division this deep little no. rivulet of uh, of black that separates the colors you said it, you really try to imitate but in a different way so and that's another that's another particularity i think of the decan uh, from other regions of india or even a later a later decan late 17th century late 16th century decan mm. so there are a number of ways that you can uh, but I think it's 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 uh, the interesting thing is that it shows so many uh, contacts and relations, and we can't we still are unable to to define these in a in a in a in a in a solid way. I mean, uh, yes, yes. No, I agree. But wow. thank you. Well, thank thank you so much, um, Arthur, for this fantastic talk. Yes, thank um, you. So please join me in thanking um, Arthur Milner for his lecture on tiles today. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I probably got a bit um, got off to a rather shaky start technically. But. <laughs> it's, it's perfectly fine. I promise you we'll edit out those, um, those <laughs> oh, yes. technical details um, when we post this video. I'm sure the Bangalore International Center Very certainly cool. will. Um, but again, thank you so much. Um, uh, we uh, will keep you posted on um, if and when we restart our, sem our seminar in the autumn. It's looking like we will because of the fantastic turnout that we've been getting and, um, and, and the desire for more knowledge um, about um, the Deccan and its art and culture. So thank you so much and we'll see you next year, um, next yes. academic year. Next